Ridge Shin is, uh, has been raising grass-fed beef and creating innovative uh, marketing ideas in, in regional food systems. And um, he's well known among organic farmers and, and uh, thinkers in New England and, and a larger area. William McCaffrey grew up on a family farm with uh, cranberries, strawberries, and, and hay growing, and uh, went off to Cornell came and studied agriculture there, and came back. And um, so he's he's um, has a lot of ideas from doing uh, orchard work in New York State, and I'm not sure exactly how many co subjects he'll cover, but probably quite a few, and um, including including passing the torch from one generation to the next, right? I'm trying. Yeah. Paul Schmidt is, uh, is, is here in two capacities, really. He's, uh, he, he's proprietor of the River Rock Farm, raising grass-fed beef uh, with some, what, what Ridge tells me, are truly extraordinary beef animals. And uh, he's also the state representative in the Mass General Court for the 8th Bristol District and a vice chairman of the Environment and Agriculture and something or else. Uh, Natural Resources. Natural Resources, thank you, committee. Environment, agriculture, and natural resources. Um, and then, in, I was in, we, we have a panelist in your program, Julie Stoltzfein is not, unfortunately, is not here. Uh, she had a medical situation to deal with today. So I was standing in the buffet line at lunch, and behind me was somebody with a name tag that, that bore the magical letters NRCS. Does everyone know that, what that stands for? Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is the part of the USDA that's actually helping. <laughs> and I really mean that. Uh, that. And she's a soil scientist. I asked her if she could address the topic of, of, uh, of soil and cover crops. And her name is um, Maggie, Payne. Maggie Payne. Let's have a hand for Maggie stepping in. Thank you. Okay, um, what I'm gonna do is uh, show a few slides and kind of try and uh, frame the discussion and then each of the panelists will spend a few minutes telling us about their uh, particular um, you know, opinion about this. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a spin on uh, Paula's question. She asked how many people were farmers. I'm gonna ask how many people are involved in farming? It should be all hands, because <laughs> uh, uh, um, the the quote is eating is an agricultural act. So every time that you make a decision in the marketplace, you're involved in agriculture. So um, basically, I was going to start here. I, I tell people I learned to farm in the 1800s. This is uh, a picture at Old Servage Village a long time ago. <laughs> in the 1970s, but uh, it's, I just put it in because it's interesting to look at agriculture and change. 200 years ago, this was agriculture in New England. It was, uh, we worked with a scythe to mow the hay, we used oxen to move anything we were gonna move. It was, uh, the land was 80% open in the Northeast by, in the 1830s. Today it's 80% wooded. So just pointing out that there is a dynamism in agriculture, things change. And I'm not putting this agriculture up as any kind of a, an idea that that was great agriculture. It was extractive. You know, most of the organic matter was mined and then they moved west. But there was low impact because you can only mow so many acres with the scythe <laughs> in a day. <laughs> so, but anyway, and in counterpoint, we have, um, where we are today. So this is the, um, this is typical uh, big ag, industrial ag. Um, you know, what we're looking at is 97 million acres of corn this year, or last year, 2004. 90% of that corn is GMO grown with uh, Roundup with glyphosate. And what's interesting is that, that the corn, you know, where does it go? About 40% goes to ethanol which some people, myself included, don't think works. Uh, another 40% goes to livestock feed, particularly to cattle, which, again, I disagree with feeding corn to cattle. And the rest of it goes into things like corn syrup, uh, 
things that have penetrated our food system um, dramatically. And so the question is why? And I think somebody had uh, you know, mentioned earlier that farmers are really aggressive in finding a market. And one of the reasons we grow this much corn is because government subsidies. Uh, I had a good friend in Canada when the ethanol thing started. He said, we looked into this and we thought of buying cropland so we could grow crops to do ethanol. But we did our due diligence and it doesn't work. Why are you people in America doing it? And I said, well, when the US government comes to you and says, here's $5 million, you build a plant, and we will make the customer buy this product, what are you going to do? <laughs> Put out your hand. And of course, it had tremendous reverberation, reverberations throughout the agricultural system. All kinds of land that had been in grass, conservation land was plowed up and planted to corn, mainly because of the incentive of money uh, in the system. Uh, the, the problem, as I see it, with industrial uh, production is really the dependence on the herbicides, pesticides, and chemical fertilizers. And so there's some, there are beginning to be some uh, pretty clear studies showing that there's some correlations to hu uh, human health that are not good with, with some of these chemicals. But the biggest crime is in my opinion, now this picture, if you were a corn farmer, you'd look at that picture and you say, this is beautiful. There's no weeds. It's perfect. In my opinion, I look at that and I say the soil, microbes, the fungi, the bacteria have been severely uh, limited in that scenario. Um, <clears throat> I drove once from uh, Pennsylvania to Illinois through the corn belt before the corn had been planted and it was, it was you know, I, something was bothering me as I drove. I realized then later that the median strip was all green and was being mowed. And the little strip on the side of the road was green and mowed. And then there was the fence and then there was the corn land. And this was for like 10 hours I drove. And there were no weeds. Zero weeds. Now if you go to Manhattan and weeds come up through the macadam. Yes. So here's our corn land. Here's our best agricultural land. And weeds won't grow. That, that, the, the, uh, the, the compromising of the soil um, health is, is extreme. But anyway, the subsidized corn lets us do this. So this is a picture, if you can't really get your head around it, it's a picture of a feedlot. That's, um, this is a Google map, anybody can go on there and get there. Each of these are pens for the cattle. These are the roads that bring the feed to the cattle. There might be 10,000 animals in this. All of the nutrients, manures and urine, flows down here. Now you don't have to be a scientist to look at that and say, uh, it seems like something might be wrong there. And, and, and what the problem is, is, um, you know, manure is a good thing. You go down to the local uh, agway store and buy a bag of composted cow manure to put on your garden. So it's a good thing. But if you have a whole lot of it in one place, it's that concentration that's a problem. Now it's a health hazard. Now, it's, now when the lagoon breaks, you'll actually pollute the Mississippi River or big, big. Uh, so, so it's the concentration that's a problem. Concentration is uh, created by the subsidized, subsidized corn. That's what gave us the idea of bringing the corn to the cattle and doing it on this kind of an industrial scale. Um, this is just a quick little picture of, uh, I call it the squirrel test. They took a piece of, uh, took an ear of GMO corn, an ear of organic corn, put it outside, and let the squirrel decide. And you can see their choice. The challenge, the challenge with this is the squirrel could decide, but we as humans don't have that choice because this other corn has penetrated our food system. Um, that's again my opinion. But the real crime of industrial agriculture is compromising the soil food web. This, uh, this, this life below the soil is critical to mineralizing our food, our plants and our food. And when we spray chemicals, use uh, severe uh, fertilizers, when we plow, there's a lot of things that destroy this soil food web or compromise it at best. Um, and this is the real challenge. This is something that has only been discovered in the 1990s. 
It's very interesting because, you know, we had the conference at Tufts and, and it was amazing to me that all of the speakers agreed completely on one issue. The one issue was that if we stopped uh, using fossil fuels today, we still couldn't get the carbon out of the atmosphere. We have to proactively put the gar carbon somewhere. And there's all kinds of engineering solutions. We drill a hole, we pump the carbon under the ground. We have this system of plants that take the carbon out of the air as CO2, make it into sugars, put it into the ground in a stable form. This glomalin, it was only discovered in the 1990s. And this is a glue that surrounds the soil aggregate and keeps that carbon stable in the soil. And this, this happens naturally if you have plants with a solar collector that can do the photosynthesis, take the carbon out of the air, put it into the plant, and put it below grade in a stable form. It doesn't happen on bare land. This is a picture, if you really want to learn some more about this, you should visit uh, Christine Jones' website. It's called Amazing Carbon. This is a picture of two farms, or one farm, where the father passed away, two sons took the farm, and farmed differently. So the farm on the left uh, continued with the kind of a conventional cropping system. The farm on the right used livestock, uh, intensively grazed, and you can see the difference. Right at the soil line, they're very similar. So the carbon up here is pretty similar. And mo a lot of people think that carbon gets <coughs> trampled in the plants in the surface of the water, in the surface of the ground is where the carbon gets put into the ground. That carbon is very volatile because carbon will oxidize. That's that what's, what happens when you plow the ground, you let the carbon into the air. So that carbon is very volatile and moves around. It's the same on both of those, those uh, plots, but if you look way down in the ground, this is all stable carbon. And these, far, these farms, side by side, different management, eight years time, created that difference in the soil carbon. And as somebody said earlier, you know, carbon, organic matter and carbon are equivalent, and the carbon is really a sponge that holds, um, holds the water. Uh, these are all the things, the benefits of grazing versus corn feeding, Resoils, restores the soil health, sequesters carbon, provides nutrient-dense food, it's tasty and tender and marketable, reduces the use of fossil fuels, and prevents drought by fostering water retention. So there's a whole lot of pluses about growing 100% grass-fed. Uh, it's a totally solar-powered system, and <coughs> it is, uh, <coughs> we're getting to the point now where the customer is beginning to understand this and demand the product. I'll talk about that in a minute. But this is, uh, again, some side-by-side -side comparisons of a couple farms with different management. The one, on, the one in Massachusetts is my farm, the farm that I lease from the land trust. And you can see there's a stone wall here. And this, par this farm has been grazed with cattle for about five years. It was corn land when I started. So it was bare corn land when I started. This farm right on the other side of the stone wall has been a hay farm for the same period of time. So basically he just mows hay, mows hay, mows hay. No livestock, uh, no manures. And what's fascinating, this was taken in July 7th this year. This grass was four feet tall. This grass was two feet tall. Same sun, same water, everything the same, different management. Same thing's the case in this South Africa. This is Ian Mitchell Innes' farm. He's a, uh, someone who's a mentor to a lot of us in the grass farming. You know, this fence line is the fence line between the two farms. And on this farm, he started this mob grazing, intensive grazing. The farm was 4,000 acres. He had 1,200 animals. Today, he has 4,000 animals on that same farm, and he leases half the farm to somebody else because he has too much grass. Simply a different difference in management. And this again is just comparing management. This is a rotational grazing. This is our cattle in Hardwick. This is, this is a conventional put the cattle out in the pasture all summer long. 
uh, and this is what it looks like. Because every time a plant grows up, the cattle come over and eat it. And you have virtually no grass. And over here, they've been excluded from parcels periodically. So, uh, you know, that's, that's, so it has a chance to rest and grow. This is what we call mob grazing or pulse grazing. And what we're trying to do is replicate the buffalo. Just as Jim said so eloquently, you know, you have this thousands and thousands of animals moving through an area and then not coming back to that area for a period of time. So we try and replicate the same thing with the cattle. So we use an electric fence to uh, kind of partition out the grass that they have access to and keep them moving and then we let them come back after that grass has um, grown sufficiently. So to do this and be successful you need a lot of things. You need the right kind of cattle, management, on and on. Well, what was interesting, back when I worked at Old Service Village, we used to see these pictures of, of uh, these uh, cattle, you know, and I always thought the, the artist was drunk. You need to see this, Paul. <laughs> so, so we, we, you know, I mean, how could they have cattle like that? So then one day in Massachusetts, guess what? <laughs> Where do you think we found that cow? We found that cow at Paul's. Right here in Westport. But that's the kind of animal that is perfect for grass. They're very deep bodied, they're wide, and they get fat on a grass only diet. What we've done in the cattle industry in this country is we have selected over the last 40 years cattle that are huge that stand on the feedlot and get ingredients poured in, but they're very big animals. They will not survive on grass. We have to go back to the cattle that were around in the 60s, 70s uh, to succeed on a grass-only diet. The other thing that we've been doing is stretching the season. Um, I guess Maggie's gonna talk a little bit about cover crops. This is a farm I work with in North Carolina. We're, we're taking uh, burned out tobacco land and turning it back into grassland. We've been working with uh, Ray Archuleta in the NRCS. So we plant what we call a, a seven or eight way cover crop eight different species, a whole bunch of different species, broadcast them out there, and then we bring this, the group of cattle in and graze it in intensity. <clears throat> See, there's the cattle a little bit closer. But, um, and these cattle are probably, interestingly, probably closer together than the cattle are on the feedlot. So they're very close together. They're, they're perfectly happy like that, but they're not forced to stay there for three months, they move. So it's really the motion and then the rest on the land that's the key to the success of this. So it's a management intensive. It, it requires a person who can, can judge whether the grass grew, how much there is, they have enough, not quite enough, and, and set up the new break, the new fence uh, to move them. But you can see they're, they're tremendously healthy and um, and in reality, our goal when we graze is to trample half the grass. Now, most farmers say, oh, you're wasting the grass. We should cut it and put it in the barn. But what we're doing is actually feeding the, the soil life by trampling that grass and laying it down on the ground. So on to marketing. Just quickly, um, you know, there is a tremendous market demand for grass-fed beef already. Uh, it's in every store. It's in Stop and Shop. It's in Costco. Uh, Target, Kroger's, and it's the highest priced category, $6.99. Um, the fact is though that most of it is coming from Australia and Uruguay and Argentina. So there's a lot of people that, you know, complain about that and I'm saying it's just fantastic. They've opened the, the, they've opened the category. Now we as U.S. have to figure out how to supply. That's our challenge, figure out how to supply into this market. It's a high-end market. It's right here. It's in all the stores in all over the country. Uh, one of the things people, do, a lot of people look at grass-fed beef and they look at the $6.99 and they say, oh, it's so expensive. So I made this slide up for those people. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you break it down and divide it out, that's what your, uh, your candy bar is 92 cents an ounce, and this incredible grass-fed beef is only 44 cents an ounce. It's actually, you know, the, you know, we could debate about the health benefits of one or the other, but 
it's pretty clear to me. Now this is fascinating because one of the things I used to say or still say is that I could stop the flooding of the Mississippi, I could cure the drought in the West, and I could cure human obesity. You just have to give me the states of Illinois, Iowa, and Indiana. <laughs> so now this is a map that just came out recently in Huffington Post. And what this shows is where uh, crops are grown for livestock and not for humans. So 98% of the crops grown in Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois go to animal feed. So that would be like being in the ocean looking for fresh water if you drove through those three states <laughs> looking for something to eat. It doesn't exist. So, so people say we can't feed the world with grass. If you gave me those three states, I could take a real good crack at it <laughs> with a big herd of cattle. And what would happen is if I could put a herd of cattle back on those prairies, which is what they were originally, we could put the carbon back in the soil, we would have this incredible sponge, and when it rains, and we have a violent storm, we capture it. It's not going to run off into the Mississippi River, which is what happens now. Um, so, you know, and, and there's a lot of research coming out now that grazing correctly can, can correct soil deficiencies. So what we're, we're in a um, process of developing a, a uh, business in the Northeast. We have a contract to produce 5,000 grass-fed beef in New England this year. These are people who are willing to pay us, okay? So we have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> so what we're, what, we're, what we're doing is, currently, there's about uh, 127,000 beef animals that come out of New England and New York every year. And guess what? The vast majority of them get on a truck and go to Kansas to a feedlot. They're in small herds. They're in herds of 20, 30, 40 head the national average herd size is 40 head. So what we intend to do is go to those little farmers in the Northeast, we already have about 35 of them that have signed on, and said, say to them, look, instead of putting those cattle on a truck and sending them out west, give them to us, we'll put them together in a herd of 500 to 1,000 animals, big herds, this is something that hasn't been done in the Northeast, and we need big land, we have our first 1,000 acre farm in New York State, and they will graze them, 500 to 1,000 head. And what will happen is that we'll create some jobs. We'll need at least two well-paid grazers there all the time to take care of those cattle. And we also will process them in the Northeast and uh, um, sell them back into the markets here in the Northeast. You know, we have the markets of the world here in the Northeast. Everybody in the world flies ships product into our markets. And we are here saying, well, we can't get into this market because I only have five, I only have three, or mine are this, or mine are that. So we, we need to get together, and this is, you know, this is our current plan. And, the, and just so people know, because some people may have tasted grass-fed beef and said, oh, it's not very good. A lot of it is not very good. I would agree with a lot of people's experience, mainly because most people that are farming don't know how to harvest the energy in the grass. Now, the, the, the protein is easy in the grass, the energy's hard, and the energy is in the top of the plant. So in order to harvest the energy, you have to constantly move the cattle so they're eating energy all the time. But if you do it right, you make a phenomenal product. This is, uh, we sampled some steaks to Dan Barber, who's a chef, uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns. And, you know, he kept saying, Dom, Rich, I can't take your steak here. You're, you're shipping it up from North Carolina. I gotta buy local. And I said, just taste it, Dan. So this was a quote. He just was stunned at the quality of 100% grass-fed beef. So if we can make a fabulous product, we can do it entirely with solar power, and we can do it here in the Northeast, which we can because we have the soils, and we also have water. You know, we can kind of chuckle at the West that doesn't have any water. We have water, and we have dairy-quality soils. So. That's the potential. And that kind of, this is the uh, eating is an agricultural act, the Wendell Berry quote. And you know, these, these are the choices that the customer doesn't understand, but needs to understand that when you buy that product, you're buying this or this. And the vast majority of the meat in the market, 98% of the meat in the market is finished on a feedlot. Even if it didn't have any antibiotics or hormones, 
still finish on the feed line. So that's a, uh, an interesting statistic. So that's enough. It's probably more than enough for me. I'm going to let each of the folks on the panel give a, a brief uh, um, indication of, you know, where they line up on the, on the uh, carbon uh, thing. And then we'll hopefully have a little bit of time for some questions. Okay. Sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, my name is William McCaffrey, and I'm from a small farm in East Taunton. My dad's sitting in the middle of the auditorium right here. Oh, can't hear you. Oh, okay. All right. There we go. How's that? All right. Um, so my dad's right there. Um, so I grew up on a small cranberry, strawberry, and hay farm and then went out to Cornell and graduated in 2010 and studied agricultural sciences and then spent a few years bouncing around the earth uh, farming here and there. But for the past three seasons, I've been working on orchards in upstate New York. And one thing that I've really learned a lot out of just watching how those trees behave with different management systems is I've the best food I've ever eaten has always come from the healthiest soil. and. You know, organic can be great in some ways, but if you're putting in an organic insecticide but you're still not emphasizing soil health, that product can still taste like junk and it's not doing any good for anything. And one of the orchards that I've worked on this past season had some low spray and then some organic blocks, but on the entire farm they didn't have any glyphosate, any Roundup used at all, which there's a lot of research coming out for saying that in addition to killing a lot of grasses and things like that that they want to get rid of in the understory because they see it as competition with those trees, it's also killing the fungi. And I think there's a really vastly underestimated power to having fungi in those operations that a lot of conventional operations ignore um, or aren't aware that they could be using as a resource. I think it was in the last one of these conferences at Tufts in November, I don't remember who it was that said it, but in a cubic yard of healthy soil, 14,000 linear miles of a fungal network in there that can pair with tree roots where the trees you know, photosynthesize and they give the fungi sugars and the fungi come up with all these other resources and hand them over to the trees. And that translates, that translates into the fruit. And red delicious apples, I think, are like the worst thing on the planet. I can't, I can't finish a single bite of them, but the apples that I had off of that orchard where they you know, were mulching or they, they just weren't using glyphosate, that alone to allow the fungi to develop and do their thing, I can eat an entire red delicious apple. Um, is there any water down here? Anywhere? Thanks. Um, so yeah, I just think that that's really critical and it's something that can be used as a resource for large operations that they aren't seeing. But um, I'll move on to the next point, just in the interest of time. I'm from a cranberry farm, and I haven't grown my own single cranberry crop in my entire life, but I've been around it my entire life. So I have some things to say if you guys have questions. But um, I was actually hoping to, and I did learn more from Jillian earlier, talking about wetlands and how that can be incorporated. But there's a lot of wetland environment on cranberry property, but cranberries themselves are grown dry. They need water, and they like having water, but they need drainage. They're not grown in an anaerobic environment, but a lot of the water resources do come from those anaerobic large wetlands. And Jillian was saying, like, well, you know, things could be happening when you're changing the water table and things like that, so I don't know. But um, there's, there's a lot of work that I think could potentially be done, depending on the legalities of it, since there's a lot of environmental protection on wetlands, specifically in Massachusetts, but that you know, we can, we can do things to try to reframe how wetlands are viewed by these large cranberry farms so that we can see them as an environment for native pollinators to save costs or, you know, in the future with colony collapse disorder, maybe we won't even be able to get as many honeybees as we need for pollination. So seeing that as a resource in addition to just somewhere that they get their water from. And, you know, whether they, like Adam's brought up a few times, whether they believe in climate change or not, if they're prioritizing those wetlands, then they're helping sequester carbon, so. Thanks. 
but there are a lot of other issues with how cranberries are grown as well that I don't really have great ideas for other than revamping the entire system because a lot of it's in monoculture. So a lot of chemical inputs that we depend on right now when we try to supplement other organic practices, like you might get paid 10 times as much, but you get a tenth of the yield at the same time. So that doesn't really work out either. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done with that. But um, one other thing I wanted to mention is just the, I think there's a lot of beauty to how we can focus on organic matter and whether someone believes that we can fix climate change or whether we just have to learn how to deal with it. The there's so much benefit to just putting carbon back into the soil either way. So whether you're a skeptic or an optimist, you're still going to do the same thing and, you know, hopefully get a good result out of it. And from that, of course, the higher quality product as well that you can market. But even so, I mean, that just says, you know, even if you don't accept climate change at all, if you can recognize, hey, if I build these fungal networks and I can increase how much organic matter is in the soil, I'm going to have a tree that's more resilient against drought and can handle more excess rain and make a red delicious that people actually want to eat, then, you know, whether you're, you know, Republican, Democrats, conservative or liberal, whatever, it can still make you money. And as long as we're living in a capitalist society, then it has to work and translate in that way. And Adam had talked about the bottom line. Um, but in, in terms of converting people to, you know, get to think about that, it's much faster to be able to go to somebody's pockets when the farm is a business and they're in it to try to make money. It would be a lot easier, you know, in some ways, if we just had to convince one person it's a dictatorship. Great, just get Kim Jong Un on our side, and you know we're good. But that's not where we're at. So thank God. But um, the the other aspect to marketing that I wanted to mention is just that although we could have the advantages of higher organic matter bringing a higher quality piece of fruit or a vegetable or whatever, or maybe a crop in a year of drought that people that don't have high organic matter soils would be able to produce is that there's still emissions and inputs that can increase our carbon footprint and that's not something that I don't I think necessarily translates into a higher quality product if it's local then yeah but if you know if you're doing everything battery powered or if you're doing it with petroleum I don't think that somebody's going to taste that in their kale and that's where something like a label and getting people to associate carbon smart farming with you know all the other labels like fair trade and organic and things like that getting that part of the whole conglomerate and getting people to look for that is something that really needs to happen if we're going to be able to bring things beyond just having good healthy soils and getting us into low emissions as well for how we're producing things and i guess the last thing that i want to say which isn't in entirely relevant, but I have a little bit of a soapbox, and I've wanted to say it at like every conference I've ever been to, and this is the first time I've get, gotten to talk at one, <laughs> is uh, I grew up on a conventional farm, and I'm engaged to someone who was also raised on a conventional farm, and I think that it's really important that when we talk about you know, organic and carbon smart farming, or just the rhetoric of how we need to grow our food, it, I too often hear it framed as like the conventional farmer is the enemy. And they're not the enemy, they're my dad, and I love my dad. And, you know, the system and the methods that we use to try to change need to change. But the, the people are, you know, tremendous resources, whether you're just looking at it in a calculated way or not, like, you know, a lot of these people that are coming back and doing a market garden now majored in English and, you know, they went to Yale and, like, that's great. It's good to have humanities, but, you know, all those skills that somebody else has from farming for 40 years can still translate to things that we're trying to do now and to alienate someone instead because, you know, we're frustrated with how things happen when that person made those decisions based on what the market was and they didn't have an option to survive agriculturally if they were following these sorts of things with knowing what they didn't know back then. You know, it's just, I think it's a little bit misguided. So, that's all.
There you go, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. Uh, well, my name is Paul Schmid, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I want to thank the uh, Institute for Sustainability and uh, BCC for sponsoring this conference. Uh, as some of you folks uh, know, uh, Bristol Community College is the leading community college uh, in the Commonwealth. No community college gets more results for less of your, the taxpayer's money, than does Bristol Community College. And we really, we really appreciate its leadership. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to be here uh, on, uh, with such a distinguished panel, and also my uh, dear friend uh, and mentor, uh, Ridge Shin, who I've been working with for about 15 years. Uh, so I uh, am a state representative for the 8th Bristol District. I was elected four years ago. Uh, my district includes all of Westport, and then a part of Fall River, a part of Freetown, and a part of New Bedford. I'm vice chair of the uh, Committee on, Natu on Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture. I'm the only farmer in the legislature. That really tells you something. There are 160 reps like me and uh, 40 senators so uh, right now, uh, one out of 200 in the Massachusetts government uh, has a background in farming. So I do my best to yell and scream up there. Uh, my wife and I uh, operate River Rock Farm. Uh, that's, one of our, that's one of our animals uh, on one of our fields. My dad bought uh, a herd of Angus about 55 years ago from down in the eastern shore of Maryland. He bought it off of one of the premier breeders at that time, uh, the Y Plantation, W-Y-E. And at that time, uh, most of the industry was still grass-fed. And my dad never bothered to change over. And people, as the industry shifted into corn, people kind of used to, uh, well, they used to snicker a little bit about River Rock Farm, that we were doing things the old way. Uh, and in fact, for many years, my father had difficulty actually getting rid of our meat. We slaughter about 12 animals a year. And he used to basically say, please, won't you take some steaks? Because people, uh, grass-fed beef does taste a little different. In grass-fed, you're tasting the meat, not the fat. And until recently, uh, there, was not there was not as great an appreciation uh, for the taste and the health benefits of uh, grass-fed beef. So my wife and I continued uh, my mother and father's uh, uh, methods, and we raise our animals without uh, antibiotics, without any chemicals on the farm. We got organically certified uh, about 10 years ago, and it was very easy because my mom, and Sue Dutra knew my mom very well, uh, my mom never allowed uh, chemicals on the place anyway, so that wasn't a big deal to change around. One, the, uh, the, the only change really we did make, Ridge, was we changed from, uh, from uh, what do they call it, where, where you don't rotational graze, you just put them out? Set stock, yeah. The, where, where you just let them go on all your fields all summer. We changed, huh? free, range. free range. We changed from free range uh, to uh, rotational grazing. And that really, that actually made a difference in the taste of our beef. Because you are absolutely right uh, ridge that when you let the animals uh, eat the tops of uh, the forage, uh, I, I, you, you somehow get a better product. So that made a big difference to us. Uh, 
things have changed uh, for the consumer, and there's now a growing demand for grass-fed uh, beef. And, and we're, we're just delighted to know that what we're doing is not only good for our health, but it's also good for our planet. And it's really the consumer that it's you. It's you who are driving that because we farmers typically respond to what people want. And it, you, we know that people have become accustomed. They expect to be able to buy locally raised fruits and vegetables. And now there's a growing expectation that they that you would be able to buy locally raised meats. And uh, God bless you, Ridge, for what you're doing in, in making grass-fed uh, beef available to a larger portion. We at River Rock Farm will continue uh, just the way we were doing 50 years ago, and that's harvesting about a dozen uh, animals. It takes us two and a half years to get an animal to maturity on Grass, you can do it in 18 months. That's another one of the wonderful, uh, that's the magic of corn. If I said grass, I meant on corn, you can get an animal to maturity on 18 months. So that just puts all the more money in a farmer's pocket, uh, provided, of course, that corn is cheap. Uh, so it takes us two and a half years. Uh, we typically calve in April, and two years later in the fall, uh, we slaughter in October. Uh, the meat hangs for uh, three to four weeks, and then we uh, butcher it, uh, double wrap it, flash freeze it, and deliver to our customers. So now let me just give you a brief overview on the legislation this year. Uh, there's two pieces of legislation, and, and as you know, in Massachusetts, our terms are two years, and every you file your legislation in the first two weeks of the first year, and then that's the legislation that is, uh, is considered for that term. So there are two pieces of legislation that I think are uh, of interest. One is uh, by uh, my colleague, uh, State Senator Barrett from Concord, and that is a, co a, a, a carbon pricing legislation. Uh, carbon pricing is something that is done in Europe and in here in North America. Uh, it's only being done in British Columbia, and I understand it's been well received. And his bill would put, would attach uh, the price of carbon on every user, and that basically means on automobile uh, fuel and on heating oil. And it would then redistribute all of the money collected back to the consumers and to the businesses. So. It, the government keeps nothing. If you, as a consumer, can use less, then you'll be giving yourself uh, a pay increase because you'll be spending less uh, carbon tax than what you get back. I think that's going to be very interesting to hear uh, the discussion uh, that goes on about that. And, and, you know, Massachusetts is a leader in so many ways. Maybe we can be a leader on the issue of uh, carbon taxing. Second uh, uh, piece of legislation is uh, one be put forward by uh, Ann Margaret Ferranti out of uh, Gloucester. And she, it, it is a food security bill. Uh, it, right now, uh, we produce, in New England, we produce about 10% of what we eat. Uh, everything else, of course, comes in from uh, the Imperial Valley or flown in from Israel or Chile. And uh, several of us, of us in the legislature think that that puts us, New England, in an insecure position so far as food supply. Ridge, you uh, mentioned that uh, uh, New England used to be 80% uh, farmland, and it has changed. Uh, that has flipped. It's now 80% uh, woodland. I think something like 10% um, uh, 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 developed. Developed. 10% developed, and something like five or seven percent 
uh, farmland. And uh, there's a group who have studied this and who have said that if we could take back maybe 10% uh, of that 80%, if we could take back 10% of that 80% of woodland, reducing it from 80 to 70, and bring farmland from 7% up to somewhere 15 to 20% of our land mass, then we could potentially get to a, a where we are raising 50% of our food. So, and that to me just makes a, a lot of sense. So that's another bill that I think is potentially important. Great. That's it, thank you. All right, I'll do, I'll make this quick. I was the last one to be, <laughs> to be called onto this panel, so I just prepared in the last few minutes. Um, my name is Maggie Payne. I work for the NRCS, the National Resources Conservation Service. I'm glad to hear people like us <laughs> in general. We are a federal, we're part of the USDA, a federal agency. And we, um, if you haven't heard of us, what our main goal is, is we are, are um, motto, I guess, is helping people help the land. We go out, we work with landowners to implement conservation practices on their land, far, mostly farmers and other landowners, um, both technical, technical and financial services we do. Um, I am a soil scientist with, with the office here in eastern Massachusetts, located down in West Wareham. Um, I might I just moved up here over the summer from Rhode Island. I'd been a soil scientist down in the Rhode Island NRCS office for about 10 years, um, studying. I, I did a lot of work on the coastal and underwater soils in Rhode Island, um, as well as some some studies on the carbon uh, carbon in soils. So that's sort of where we're where we're going with the with what we're talking about today. I I actually helped organize one of the they did a nationwide assessment of what what our carbon pools are in the soils. So I, I organized some of the some of the studies in the north, whole northeastern part of the part of the country. Um, so just a quick history of of our agency. We were born out of the basically out of the Dust Bowl in the 30s, the, as the Soil Conservation Service or the Soil Erosion Service, as we were originally called, um, as a recognition that we needed to better manage our soils. We were losing all of our prime farmland soils in the in the Dust Bowl. Um, we were wrapped wrapped up in with the with a soil survey. We, that's part of what I'm involved with is the National Soil Survey, where nationwide we have and we update the the soil maps. So we have soil maps for the entire country, pretty much. We have it for the entire state of Massachusetts. Um, now it's all available online, but we also have printed versions. Um, so. We do, we do a lot of technical work on that, and that's all available for basically information on what your, what your soils look like. It's, it's going to tell you what, your, um, what the physical properties are, what the parent materials are, and it's really good information for people that are, that are looking at land, um, using new land. If you're going to get new agricultural land, it's a really important resource. Um, to, you know, if you're going to clear new land, you're going to want to clear the best soils. What it doesn't show, though, is it doesn't show some of a lot of what we're talking about today, those dynamic soil properties, things that we can change. Um, and those are how much carbon is in the soil is one of the big ones. Um, so those are things that in the soil maps, it can be mapped as the same type of soil. But one of them that's been in forest for 100 years is going to have different amounts of carbon than one that's been tilled for the last 100 years. Um, and so those are, that's sort of another aspect of what I do in, and what our whole agency does, is trying to keep people using their land in agriculture, productive, we want productive agricultural land, but we want it to be used correctly. Um, and so one of our, our agency has been working for a while, but just in the past few years, we've really been pushing this, what we call the soil health campaign, and that's the main goal of it is to bring carbon back into the soils. Main, mainly what we're focusing on is the agricultural side of it for agricultural production, um, but we're also bringing into, bringing into it the climate change aspect of it. Our agency, we, our goals are to um, protect the soil, the water, the air, the plants, the animals, and the human health. So we look at the whole, the whole picture. 
Um, so just quickly, what the the soil health campaign, what we what we can do for people is we can help people sort of come up with a soil health management plan to to help improve your soil health. You need to look at the whole picture of it. You need to um, think of think of your soil as more of a habitat for all those microorganisms that are in your soil rather than just something you're drawing plants, you're growing plants out of and then harvesting them and taking them away and adding fertilizer if you need it. Um, so if you can think of it more of the biological side of things, you're preserving this habitat for these microorganisms that are helping you grow um, good crops. So the, the three main things that we look at are keep your, keep your soil covered, either through cover crops, um, using mulches, using um, those are two of, the, two of the main ones, doing things like roller crimpers instead of, instead of tilling it up in the spring. Um, basically what that does, it stabilizes soil temperatures, it protects from erosion is a huge one, just as those raindrops hit bare soil, it pulls that soil right off of your land. Um, the other thing we want to do is reduce the disturbance. We were talking before about the amount of how f fungi is really important in your soil. Every time you till up that soil, you're k basically killing a lot of the fungi and other microorganisms. They don't want to be exposed to that air. As, the, as they're exposed to air, you're also losing a lot of your carbon just in, in oxidation. So doing things like low-till, no-till uh, farming is a, good, is a good goal to work toward. Um, and then also having a diversity of plants in your, in your system, so not just growing corn all the time. Um, if you are growing corn, plant a diverse cover crop in off seasons. Um, if you can rotate crops, do that. Um, so that's going to that's gonna help with adding diversity to the, your microorganism population and adding things like disease resistance, things that those microorganisms can provide for you in your soils. Um, let's see, is, is there's anything else I wanted to cover here? So benefits of having higher carbon in your soils um, besides helping out with climate change, you know, getting that carbon out of the atmosphere is a really important thing, but just for the soil itself, it increases the water holding capacity. You're, you're instead of rain hitting the soil and just running off, you have much better structure. Your, ra your rain is going to infiltrate down into the soil and carbon is one of the things that holds on to water really well. So it's going to hold on to the water in your soil you're not going to have to irrigate as much. Um, reduced erosion, like I said, sediment is one of our number one pollutants in our water systems today, just from things running off, soil running off into our, into our waters. Hold that soil on your, on your land, it's going to improve it. Um, better nutrient availability and less nutrient, nutrients running off, so you don't have to add as much to your soils. Um, so, in conclusion, I'm I'm here in the West Wareham NRCS office. If anybody ever wants to talk soils with me, I'm, I'm there to do it. We have other staff. Lisa's here with us today um, that, that man that office. And we have, NRCS has offices throughout um, every state um, and in, in a lot of counties. I don't, I don't even know how many offices there are in Massachusetts, but we have them. They basically cover different counties. Um, 2015 is our International Year of the Soils. If people haven't heard of it, we're trying to sort of publicize that. I think there were some posters out front. So we're, we're happy that people are finally interested in soil. <laughs> I, I was happy to see a, the soil conference here today. I was really glad to, glad to be able to come today. Um, soil is always sort of the overlooked, I feel like, the overlooked part of the whole science. People think, you know, that's totally boring. I don't want to talk to you about soils. Um, so we're, we're trying to push the International Year of the Soil. Um, and we're just through NRCS here in Massachusetts, we're, we're trying to plan a sort of a soils day to try and get, get people some information on what we do as NRCS. Um, it's in the works right now, but it should be sometime in May. Um, so hopefully we'll get some pub publications out on that pretty soon. And finally, just for the soil health initiative that we're doing, I, I am trying to um, get some sort of study sites off the ground. So if anybody has areas that, that they'd like 
me to come look at. I'd be happy to do that. We're looking for areas that maybe people are doing some of these practices that are supposed to improve soil health. We'd like to get some actual hard measurements on what is being improved in those. There isn't a whole lot of research in, in all of this. Um, so for us to be able to prove, prove what these changes are, we'd like to be able to do some of that. So come talk to me afterward if you have a site. Thanks. Uh, I think uh, I want to just thank everybody on the panel. I think we're going to move right along to the next panel. Or do you want to take questions? I mean, we're. One or two questions. Okay. Is there any pressing question anybody wants to ask? <laughs> Here's one. Um, <laughs> microphone. Our microphone. Maggie. I know the federal government agencies do not all speak with one voice, but how does your agency feel when um, the EPA continues to uh, promote this insecticides or the Roundup and all of that while you have a completely different message about what's healthy for the soil? Do you all go crazy or do you just say like, nobody listens to us, they all, what, what gives with that? I don't know if I can speak for our agency on that, but I mean, you know, for some people, they they do still need to use some chemicals and things like that. So we we aren't. I can't say that our agency is you know is totally pushing organic or anything like that. We're we're there to help people with what they need to do, um, and we want to keep their farms productive. We're trying to get make it more sustainable. Um, and we're very separated, I think, from, from things like EPA. It, it can be frustrating with some of them, but um, we kind of continue on, on our mission. And I don't know. <laughs> I, I have a, a little comment. William McCaffrey pointed me out as his father. And uh, all I wanted to say was that the panelists that I see here and with the job that this uh, group is doing and the the lady they're talking about schools are just quick story um, My father was a factory worker in Taunton and we didn't have any money. We had a big garden uh, We all had to work on the garden. We had to provide food and as a little kid like this Lady is talking about the schools. I remember hearing JFK saying ask not what your country can do for you But what can you do? what he meant was as a little kid, do something. Well, this whole group is saying, do something. And what I'm saying is, I looked at that and I said, well, what can you do? I said, well, I can get a farm. I can be a farmer. So I looked around and I kept found a farm. Uh, Jimmy Carter was in office. Interest rates was 12%, 1980. Uh, you can make a difference. And then I went out and bought a farm. And now here, I went to buy that farm on Sunday night, Monday morning. There was a trailer park. The lawyers were there. They were all in the tady. The old woman had her money. She said, they're going to put in this trailer park. They're going to take the money. The old lady stood up. She said, I met some young fellow last night, 26 years old. I'm going to sell him the place. And, he's, and, and you gentlemen can leave. And, and so ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what this panelist can do. All of what you're saying, here it is, our son now gone to Cornell to be a farmer. And we all can make a difference. That's all I got to say. Thanks. That, that's all we have time for, for questions.